Hi, everyone. Thank you so much today for joining us at the Autism Research Coalition. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Neil Nathan with us. Welcome, Dr. Nathan. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm just going to give the audience a little bit of a background about you, and then we're going to dive into all things um, ASD, Lyme, mold related. So Dr. Neil Nathan has been a practicing medicine for 50 years and has been board certified in family practice and pain management and is a founding diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine and a founding diplomat of ISEAI. He has written several books, including Healing is Possible, New Hope for Chronic Fatigue, Fibromyalgia, Persistent Pain, and Other Chronic Illnesses, and on Hope and Healing for Those Who Have Fallen Through the Medical Cracks, which is many of our kids. Um, Dr. Nathan will discuss the role of mold toxicity and Lyme disease in the pathogenesis of neurodevelopmental conditions, including autism. So again, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're really excited to have you. So let's just dive in, Dr. Nathan. Um, you know, you are pretty much like the, the almost like the, the, the beacon where people are thinking about mold and also thinking about Lyme. So why don't you give us a little bit of a background on how you kind of discovered, you know, this pathogenesis and how it relates to basically um, neuro, neurodevelopmental conditions, including autism. Okay. Uh, that's a really long story. So I'm going <laughs> to give you, I'll give you the short version. Okay. Um, I got into this field largely through my work in pain. Um, in the mid-1980s, um, I was the medical director of a pain clinic, uh, a hospital based in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and we began to see an odd condition, um, which was then called fibrositis and later became fibromyalgia, which is how we know it today. And as I began working with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, it became very clear to me that autism was very uh, biochemically related to those conditions. It seemed that the same um, imbalances in the body that eventually led to fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, when it occurred in a younger being, like a child, it led to an autism-like syndrome. And I began to treat autism at that point too. I got involved fairly early on uh, with the Defeat Autism Now program. And I, I found that the underpinnings medically fit a larger group of people who not only had chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, but also a lot of neurodegenerative conditions. Over time, it became apparent that a lot of the people who had these conditions had also Lyme disease. And as our understanding that Lyme disease had become almost an epidemic, <clears throat> as of um, 2018, the CDC admitted that we have 400,000 new cases of Lyme disease every year. And so the epidemic of Lyme disease at that point was just beginning to be talked about. It's quite controversial, as I'm sure everyone is aware. But from my perspective as a clinician, it was very real. And that by diagnosing and treating Lyme and co-infections, I began to be able to help a whole lot of patients that I hadn't before. About 2005, with the publication of Dr. Richie Shoemaker's book, Mold Warriors, he opened up our eyes to how common and serious mold toxicity was in, again, causing these conditions. So that's a kind of a brief history of how I got into this, because my interest has always been helping people as much as I could. And I slowly gravitated into helping the people that many of my colleagues didn't quite know what to do with. So I kind of began to specialize in these areas and found that by looking for and diagnosing Lyme disease and mold toxicity, I could help a whole lot of people that were otherwise languishing. 
know, um, oops, sorry. As we know, um, there's just so many people, you know, with a, such a wide range of disorders who are have, have fallen, but you know, in the cracks because there's so many practitioners that don't know exactly how to help them. So it's amazing that you, you know, are really in a way like just focusing on the marginalized and trying to help them, and that's just a wonderful thing. So we appreciate that. I think many people appreciate that. So it's really interesting how you mentioned how um, you you know, kind of fell into it with the whole role of fibromyalgia, how with the chronic fatigue. Chronic fatigue is really interesting because I was when I was reading just a bit more about you, um, you know, and we have obviously people in the ASD community are always talking about sermon, you know, which has kind of that, you know, that cell danger response situation, which is a similar situation with chronic fatigue because it's you know, freaking sleeping sickness, et cetera. So, and I, I was reading some regarding you and um, Dr. Naveau, how you guys are colleagues and you had posted about him as well. So it's very interesting, you know, to make these connections and you would think that other people in mainstream media, <coughs> mainstream media, excuse me, mainstream medicine would also make these connections, but it doesn't seem to specifically be the case. Um, you know, there's, a, there's only a select few of you that are really making these huge changes. Um, so as you mentioned, um, so what is the role of mold toxicity in autism? If you can, you know, um, maybe break it down like on a, like a mechanism of action, How, like what exactly happens in the body of someone who, you know, has um, ASD, like what's going on in their body, do you think? A whole lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there's two ways in which mold toxicity will affect autism per se. Number one, um, it, can, it can create a medical condition that looks like autism, but is actually purely mold toxicity. And we have seen quite a few children who, when diagnosed with mold toxicity and then treated with it, get well. They don't, to any way of looking at it, look like they have autism anymore. So in other words, the symptoms can be almost identical. And when you treat it, sometimes it will go away. The second aspect of it is if someone has a predisposition to autism, which means those biochemical imbalances that predispose a child to have autism, and they then have mold toxicity, that will profoundly exacerbate that and very definitely needs treatment. So my, my first... Um, comment is they're related very, very closely. Mold toxin is nasty stuff. Um, the Department of Defense began looking at mold toxicity as biological warfare back in the 70s and 80s. And some of what we know about using binders comes from that research. So I, I just want to emphasize that mold toxicity is pretty nasty. And it's not rare. It's estimated by many authorities that there could be up to 10 million Americans at this moment who have some degree of mold toxicity that they're wrestling with. So we're not talking about a, a rare condition that nobody sees. It's extremely common. Um, it comes primarily from exposure to moldy buildings, which are rampant, especially in children's worlds. For example, many schools or preschools have moldy environments. They're not funded very well. If there is a leak or water damage to the building, it doesn't always get repaired properly. So many of the children are really being exposed to mold early on. Often they grow up in a moldy environment in which nobody realizes that there's mold. I can't count the number of people that I've uh, taken care of over the years who, when you ask about it, had no idea that that black gunky stuff under the windowsill or growing on the wall of the basement or you name it meant something. It's just, oh, that's just mold. I'll just cover it over with bleach and it'll be okay. And no, that won't work and know that that's not an answer. The physiology, which you're asking about, <clears throat> is that mold toxin literally poisons or affects almost every system in the body possible. It has a profound effect on the brain and nervous system. So it can cause directly anxiety, depression, OCD, mood shifts, behavior changes. 
it can cause cognitive issues and cognitive difficulties, which will look like sensory processing disorders if not looked at carefully or properly. It can cause headache, pain, both joint and muscle pain of every variety. It can cause shortness of breath, as, asthma-like conditions. Um, what we call air hunger can cause a variety of sinus conditions. Um, all kinds of gastrointestinal issues from um, severe diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so mold toxin can present in profound and very widespread systems of the body so that if a physician has not seen it before, you can look at what's coming into your office and going, oh, nobody has all those symptoms. This can't be possible. So this must be in your head. And it's not. So I, I think that's my starting point for answering your question. Yeah, that's, um, wow. Yeah, pretty disturbing, actually. Um, because you're exactly right. I mean, there's, I think that most of us, regardless of where we live, we see a little bit of mold and you don't really, you know, go to the extent of thinking that maybe your illness is caused, um, you know, in part by what is you're living in, your living situation or your school situation. So it's incredibly interesting. Um, so I guess we would dive into next, let's say that, you know, let's, we have a case study, you know, we have a case um, and a child presents with ASD, like you're mentioning, you've worked with some children. Um, and for, let's maybe, do you want to use a case study? Maybe of someone that you've worked with, um, you know, we can call them John. And, um, but someone maybe who, you know, had the mold toxicity, you, you tested, you treated, and it ended up that they are, they're, you know, I guess we're talking obviously for ASD for the audience, not someone who has something else, but diagnosed ASD and their um, symptoms of ASD, which they, there's a variety, improved. Do you want to give us maybe a case study of, of someone that you might, if, I know it's kind of throwing it out there, but. <laughs> um, I mean, I could make you up a composite. Um, sure. Often this will occur in families. So uh, you might have a family who had um, water damage to their building. Maybe they lived in Houston or Miami or New Orleans and a hurricane came through, or even in the East Coast um, where hurricanes will sometimes sweep up the coast and cause profound water damage. I mean, People first try to get through that experience, and they often don't recognize that if they don't get that area dried up and the water removed within 72 hours, there's a really good chance that mold will start growing in that area. So let's take a hypothetical family, uh, father, mother, two kids, and maybe the kids were doing okay before this happened, but all of a sudden, one or both children, and keep in mind, there is a genetic predisposition to mold toxicity. So that it's estimated that roughly 25% of people are genetically wired or predisposed to get mold toxicity, and 75% of people are not. So you can have four people in this hypothetical household in which one gets sick and the other three do not. And then people go, well, that's weird. Why am why are you sick and why am why are we not? And often the implication is there's something psychological going on with that person, but especially with kids, we don't see it that often. So we we have to also take that piece into consideration. So the child who's been, I don't know, call them five years old, just starting kindergarten, they've been okay for a while. Um Maybe they have a mild sensory processing disorder, but they've kind of been okay. And all of a sudden, there are tantrums. They rage. They get furious and angry all the time. They get neurological tics or seizure-like disorders. They begin to um, not be able to focus. Their usual attentive qualities get lost. People who are loving and kind, they become withdrawn, frightened, scared. Their anxiety is palpable. And um, if they're lucky, they'll get into the hands of someone who goes, oh, okay, you were in a water damaged building, you probably have mold, let's go look for it. And they get a simple urine test, very easy to do. And we see that someone has mold toxicity, and then we treat them. 
And lo and behold, uh, that child or children go, they become sweet, loving uh, beings again, and everyone goes, yay. I mean, that's kind of a fairly common scenario in my world. That sounds wonderful. I'm sure everyone would love that. So, and, and in terms of testing, um, I, you know, why don't we jump into that? So for the testing, obviously a lot of people use the, the mycotoxin, mycotoxin, excuse me, test from uh, Great Plains Lab. That's been a big one that people use. Um, obviously also on the organic um, acids tests, you have the like aspergillus markers and things like this. Are these type of tests the ones that you prefer or is there a better lab that you like to run things through? Yes and no. Um, the, the lab that I think currently gives us the best information is the real-time lab. Um, the Great Plains test used to be quite consistent. And in the last year or two, their mycotoxin test has not been reproducible or consistent. In fact, I got off the phone this morning with the CEO of Great Plains who admits that their that laboratory has had some difficulties and they're currently in the process of retooling it, thinking it'll be a, six months to a year before they're getting the same results that they used to. So for anyone out there who is a practitioner, you might want to hold off on Great Plains mycotoxin testing. And instead, we consider real time currently the best test on the market. That's not the case for the oat test, it uses a different technology, and the oat test from Great Plains has always been consistent and is perfectly fine. It's not as specific for mold as the mycotoxin test. Mycotoxin test very basically is looking in the urine for a variety of mold toxins. If they're there, you have it. Very simple. The, the oat test is a, a lot less specific because it's looking at what we call metabolites, which are the breakdown products of mold in the body. So there are things we can look at on the oat test that point to the possibility of mold toxicity, but it's nowhere near as specific as actually measuring the mycotoxins, which is by far my preference. And that's actually amazing too for you to have divulged that information because a lot of people I've never even heard of real time. So that's really wonderful because I know it's been very difficult for some people to to try to compare the two. And so hopefully um, Great Plains can you know revamp everything and get everything up to you know up and running correctly in you know the next six months. So I think that's really helpful because you know testing is expensive for people as well. So when they're just throwing money and thinking maybe they're fine or they're getting false results or whatever the case may be. Um, thank you for telling us that. That's really interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to dive into a little bit of questions. We already have some coming up. Um, we have one from Alex and he says, uh, do you think that Austin, excuse me, do you think that autistic children are more susceptible to mold toxicity or colonization based on a, a common history of existing dysbiosis? Uh, for instance, does overuse of antibiotics early in life or at any stage lay a foundation to being more susceptible to moldy situations? Maybe this combined with some genetics. That's a big question, but. That would be yes, 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 and yes. Okay. <laughs> so. All you about so one of the common threads of many children, I would even say most, who are on the spectrum is dysbiosis. A, uh, the microbiome of the gut has been disrupted and um, that allows overgrowth of candida and mold. And that is a common thread in many of those children. Um, often it is all because they were treated early on with antibiotics, which then set the stage for the colonization with candida and then later, later mold. So, uh, uh, yes, that's very, it happens and it happens commonly. I think that's the simple answer here. Yeah. And um, it's, I guess, the just to add on to that question, because there are a lot of cases of children who were treated you know, too much with antibiotics at early age, exacerbating the microbiome issues and the dysbiosis. Um, is there is there hope to get out of that? You know, because then you kind of just are in this when you're really in it. Um, so then treating, like then when you hit the mold and you get the the issues. But you know, that's a really um, that's like the foundation is is the gut. So 
does that need to be in place first before you can really hit the other mold, you know, markers that are on there? Um, or is it just kind of a together? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Okay. I think one of the common errors in treating mold is the basic assumption in functional medicine is the gut must be treated first and balanced before you do anything else. That's true for a wide variety of conditions, but here's the kicker. If you don't get rid of the mold and candida first, all the treatments that we typically use for dysbiosis don't work very well. And I have seen many practitioners refer people to me and they've been working on that gut for two or three years and they just can't get it fixed. That's because you've got to treat the mold and candida first. Otherwise, you're not going to make progress with the other. The other comment that I'd make, I'd like to weave a couple of threads into this, is that I perceive the children who enter the autistic world, if you will, and I think this is a phrase commonly used in this world as the canaries in the coal mine. I think they are a bit more sensitive to a wide variety of things. My underlying thesis is that the world that we look at, the world that we live in and inhabit is much more toxic than most people realize. There are 80,000 chemicals in our environment that didn't exist in this environment 50 years ago. The vast majority have never been tested in human beings. We are exposed to EMFs in amounts that are astronomical. And I know that the universe is in love with 5G, which means that 5G is a thousand times more powerful a signal than 4G. And I think 4G was having an effect on many children who are electro, electromagnetically sensitive. And so we're looking at a toxicity that is global. And the children, I think, who develop autism are the more sensitive of the group, the ones where those stimuli are not able to be put aside or ignored by those bodies. They affect them profoundly. And then we're off to the races. Absolutely. Um, oh, it's, it's depressing when we go there to 5G. Um, but you're absolutely correct. I 100% uh, agree with what you're saying. And um, we have some questions that popped up. Let me just go back really quick. Um, one of the questions that was a great question, because this actually comes up in a lot of the groups, um, and this one is from Amy. She said, what is the best way to test your home for mold? I use the ERMI. This is Amy saying, I use the ERMI, but was told that testing has limitations. So what is your preferred <laughs> test to test your house? Okay. All tests have limitations. The, although the ERMI was developed as an experimental test, um, there are many people who turn to that and go, oh, it's not intended for that. It shouldn't be used for that. However, in actual practice, it's probably the most accurate test we have for determining mold toxin in a building. And it's a test you can get on your own without requiring a, um, a remediation expert to check it out. Um, I'm also fond of mold plates, which are simply um, a Petri dish that grows mold. You simply take the Petri dish, take the top off, put it on the floor of the room, let it sit open to air for two hours, put the plate back on and see what grows. The beauty of that, it's not quite as accurate as ERMI, but you can put it in every room of the house, crawl space, attic, garage, um, basement, so you can get a quick read on if there's mold, where is it? Um, the usual way of checking mold is unfortunately the gold standard in the building industry, and that's called air sampling, in which you literally take a small pump and suck a little bit of air from the middle of a room. Now, the reason that that's not very helpful is that mold spores are heavier than air and they fall to the floor. So if you're sampling hair, you may not find anything when there's actually quite a lot of mold in that environment. Um, and I know this sounds mean spirited, but it's not intended to. The reason that it is the gold standard of the building industry and by landlords all over the country is because you can go into a home, have an expert measure the mold in an air sample and say, no, nah, you have no problem. I don't know what you're talking about. And legally, you can stand on that. 
But in point of fact, that is a, uh, a travesty. It's a nefarious way of blowing something off that should not be blown off. Absolutely. Um, everyone's getting a real dose of truth today from you, Dr. Nathan. We appreciate well, but, it. But I love it. Um, yes, there are some scary things about what I'm saying, but I, I want to say this and I'll say it as often as you all want to hear it. Here's the good news. Mold toxicity is diagnosable fairly easily and treatable. So yes, you might be concerned that this is going on, but here's the good news. We can treat it. The same thing is true of Lyme disease. So we're not talking about something where, I'm sorry, you've got this terrible condition. There's nothing we can do about it. We can do things about this. So that's my take home message, which is the reason to know about it is because if it is playing a role in your child and their illness, look for it and treat it. And you have a really good chance that your child will get better. No, absolutely. I mean, it's just, I, I like the truth bombs that you're setting off because people, there's a lot of chat and chit chat and chatter and people read things and it gets very muddy, you know, and people don't know what to believe. And then people say, no, but I heard this and I heard this and it really gets funky. And so that's why we're so happy to have you to really like set you know, what are the best testing to, to run? What are the things that, that you know, you've seen because mm -hmm. you are the expert and also, you know, not not all doom and gloom because it gets a little muddy. And so to be able to basically say, no, like you can still treat it. You just have to do X, Y, Z. And it's it just helps. I think really the families that are <coughs> to really like they need like a flashlight to be able to right. see where they're going because it can get a little muddy. Let me give you a couple of resources for that. Um, um, first of all, if you don't want to read something really long, um, I have an ebook that I wrote in 2016 and I updated it just this year. And so you can get it easily from Amazon. It's simply called um, Mold and Mycotoxins Current Evaluation and Treatment 2022, brand new. And it's an update of my previous book. It's about 40 pages and it is a fairly concise understanding of what mold toxicity is how you diagnose it, and how you treat it. So that's a starting point. If you want to have this put in much greater perspective, um, the book that I wrote in 2018 is called Toxic. Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, and Other Environmental Illnesses. And it is a much more comprehensive book about not just mold, but also Lyme, um, mast cell activation, and all the conditions that are triggered by mold and by Lyme disease that need to be looked at when you're looking at someone who has these kinds of illnesses. And it goes into detail about all of the treatments that are possible that I have seen work. So again, I perceive it to be a book of hope, but that has been a resource Gosh, we've sold close to 40,000 copies of that. And I've, I'm, I'm gratified that I get nice comments from all over the world about how that information has helped people to get well. So I, if you don't know that much about it, I really would encourage you to read more. No, absolutely. And um, I know what I'll be doing tonight. Absolutely. So I appreciate that information. Um, and actually, I wanted to, I had written this down before because you had mentioned um, mast cell. Um, and there was a question that I had received earlier that was saying, um, how does mast cell excitation and histamine overload relate to toxic, excuse me, mold toxic patients? Very profoundly. If mold goes unrecognized and not treated, over time, you will eventually, it'll, it'll develop into mast cell activation in which the mast cells, which are a cellular bridge between the immune system and the nervous system, become super reactive to potentially anything, any stimuli, um, anything you eat or drink when the mast cells are activated, surprisingly, even water can trigger it. And what you get is the release primarily of histamine, which you're alluding to, but 200 other inflammatory mediators into the body. Now, what that means is this will add a whole layer, profound layer of inflammation to an already inflamed system. 
So if we have mast cell activation operating here, it'll make our patients worse. And it certainly applies to children with on, on the spectrum because that will aggravate it. I suspect sometimes, because I, I hear these reports a lot, child is doing better with whatever treatment they're getting and all of a sudden they tank. They all of a sudden go from being more at peace and more comfortable and more relaxed to um, freaking out again in whatever way that they express that. Sometimes that's mast cell activation and it's important that people understand that and, and look into it because again, that's treatable. Love it. I love that you always circle back to that it will, it is treatable, which we appreciate. Um, wonderful. There was an interesting question because I, in reading your past, um, like treatment recommendations, I'm sure there's obviously more than one. Um, there was a good question here from Stevie um, talking about, I'm going to mess it up, amph amph amphipater. Amphitericin B. Thank you. Um, and so, sorry about that. So this, I mean, we, we're not going to give specific medical advice, obviously, because you definitely need to consult your doctor. But an interesting kind of a general question um, where this person had mentioned that um, they had given this medicine and their child was doing better, improving, like you said, but like those gains weren't sticking. So it was like a 14 day thing. So again, we're not giving specific um, dosing of anything, but what are your recommendations? If you take something like this AB, we're going to let you say that word, and then you have improvements, but then you go off of something and then you're slipping backwards. What are your thoughts on that? Is it like too short? We need more? We need to do more testing? Well, forgive me, but it's fairly obvious. It means you haven't given it long enough. Um, I think some people don't understand that candida and mold, when they colonize in the body and they do commonly aren't easy to eradicate. They love being in that body. The, the host is fabulous. The temperature is perfect. There's a ton of nutrients that they have access to. It's dark, it's moist. Why would they leave? So you, you can't be kind of nice to mold or candida. It requires aggressive treatment to get it out of the body. And in our experience, it often takes a year or more to get candida and mold out of the body. A 14-day course, not going to cut it, not even close. And in addition, and again, I, I, I encourage people to learn more about it, it isn't just about taking an antifungal like amphotericin B, but about a more comprehensive program, which is you need to be on the binders that bind that specific toxin while you take amphotericin B and you need to expand it to be sure that you're covering the entire gamut of what is in that body. Translation, you have to measure what's in that body by doing urine mycotoxin tests. And then you've got to treat it comprehensively. A lot of antifungal medications we have known for a long time help kids on the spectrum. That's well known. Uh, one of my dear friends and mentors, Sid Baker, used to call his treatment program the antifungal parade, in which he'd give a variety of antifungal medications and he would observe with each different medication, children would also notice clear, obvious improvement. So um, the answer to your question is, this is not a short-term fix. This requires a significant amount of time to get this out of the body. No, absolutely. And I think that that is probably one of the biggest, um, you know, missteps a lot in a lot of MAPS doctors, et cetera, they give in a way it's almost, it's too short. You know, they think, okay, let me do this. Like you said, 15, uh, day, whatever day course it is. And then you haven't gotten it under control and now it's all sometimes is worse because then there's more room and then it's the regrowth. And we did have Dr. Baker on and what he gave us that one case study um, with, I'm not going to remember, but um, the guy from the great, the great plains lab. And uh, it was amazing. You know, the, the rapid recovery of the child of autism who had autism um, from aspergillus with the Spornox. Um, 
And it was amazing. Now, obviously that's just, that's one case, N equals one, but still it's, it's a pretty amazing situation. I guess jumping into that, um, you know, what are you open to talk about your preferred treatments or is that more something like they really, people need to consult to know their specific situations? I'll give you an overview. Um, I don't have a protocol. I know everybody wants to know the Nathan method, and there is none, because every being that I treat is biochemically and genetically unique. So this is not a one-size-fits-all process, not in any way, shape, or form. So, however, the overview is, if you have mold toxicity, there are three main components of treatment. One, you have to look at the environment, home, school, car, and be sure that it's mold free. If it's not, you cannot get well if you continue to be exposed to mold. Super important and difficult for financial reasons and social reasons and a variety of other things. It's not always easy to, to remediate, afford remediation, or move. But Bottom line, you cannot get well if you stay in a moldy environment. Second, you want to use what we call binders. Those are things like charcoal, clay, chlorella, saccharomyces, and some medications that we use to specifically bind the toxins that we find in the urine. And we can get quite specific about it. Third, most of the people we treat have colonized. Colonization means that the mold or candida are now growing in the, in the gut or the sinus area. And we have to use, as we've been talking about, antifungal medication to eradicate it from those areas so that the body isn't making mold toxin ongoing. And, and that's the basic principle. Again, if I'm not being self-serving, if you wanna know more about it in, in both of my books, we go into that in a lot more detail. No, absolutely. And I guess uh, just to uh, jump onto that question as well, um, is that I have read about this um, where, you know, everyone's thinking like colonization in the gut, in the gut, in the gut, which of course that's, yes, but you take an oats test, you see it in the urine, but also the nose area um, is very interesting, you know, and I've, I've read about this as well. Do you do it at the same time? Like you said, you were trying to basically stop it from coming in, if you will, and how in the nose area, you know, even like with COVID where there's, you know, uh, situations where it can it just seems like this is a perfect area. And so are you hitting at the same time with gut and with the um, with the nasal treatment? The simple answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know everything needs to be very specified for sure. And again, right. you know, like you said, it's 100%. Each person is different. There is no perfect protocol. Um, meaning like, you know, flat rate because, and I like that you say that because so many times people are like, oh, I'm doing a gut reset or I'm doing this. And you're like, okay, but that does not pertain to every single person. It's not going to have the same outcome. It's impossible to have the same situation. Unless maybe you're living in the same house and that's something else. But um, even, even living in the same house, true. you still have different biochemistry and genetics. And so I've often seen that the treatment I'm giving um, a mother may not be the treatment I'm giving the father or a child. So I, it's... It's very... Individual. Right. It has to be. It has to be. Um, there was a good question too. I um, mean, you know, there, there's the two, even though like, as you've mentioned that the Great Plains test is not really up to par at the moment, but there have been two um, markers that seem to happen a lot that seem to, you know, even if you don't have the other seven, um, there's two that are tend to hit, which are the gliotoxin and the ochratoxin A. Those tend to be the ones that almost across the board, everyone's hitting. Um, there was a good question about gliotoxin, which said, um, can you explain the release of gliotoxin when fungi is threatened? Sure. Making toxins is very, very um, energy costly for a mold cell or candida. It doesn't just do it willy nilly and make it all the time just because. It makes it to deal with threat. You can probably understand this best in terms of, I'm talking to you right now from my home in Northern California and I live in the Redwoods and right outside my window here is a whole forest. There are probably a thousand species of mold in that forest and the species of mold prefer certain 
ecological environments. So you have some that prefer the redwood trees, the azalea bushes, the rhododendrons, the tan oaks, the alders, and so on. So each species of mold makes toxin not to make us sick, but to keep other mold species out of its environment so that it can kind of keep to itself and do its little thing wherever it is. When mold starts to grow in buildings, it is often growing unopposed. It doesn't have that balance that nature brings to the table. And again, it makes toxin in response to threat. So what happens as a part of our treatment, and there's medical research that confirms it, is that mold species make their mycotoxin when they feel threatened. So if I am giving antifungal medications, they're going to make a little bit more toxin to try to dissuade the patient from doing that. And that's kind of the nature of the game. Gliotoxin is made by both Aspergillus and Candida. And it's, again, its function is to not make us sick, but to deal with what it perceives to be, be a threat. Okay, perfect. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and so, sorry, my my son decided to just jump on in. Um, any, oh, one second. It's okay, we can still hear you. Maybe. I'm going to jump right in, Doctor, if you don't mind. So I, I know that we you you also wanted to to, sh, um, to discuss a little bit the the role of Lyme in, in autism. So I would like to to ask you if you could kind of give us an overview of your research, uh, you know, regarding Lyme on 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 ASD. Sure, and that's been known for some time. A number of people who are prominent in the ASD world have talked for quite some time that. Um, you really want any child who has this diagnosis to look for both mold and, and Lyme. I, I, if you don't look for it, you're missing a wonderful opportunity to actually treat something that can make a big difference. So one of my messages to you, if I have one, is if you have a child anywhere on the spectrum, look for mold, look for Lyme early on because they're treatable. So we've been talking a lot about mold and a lot of people know more about Lyme than mold. So I, I like talking about mold just so that I can kind of raise consciousness about how common it is and how it really needs to be looked for. But in terms of, of Lyme, um, again, as I started saying in the beginning, it's way more common than people realize and needs to be looked for there is an amazing similarity between the symptoms of mold toxicity and the symptoms of Lyme disease and the co-infections. And sometimes people think that's weird. Maybe it is, but the, but the reason for that is although mold is a toxin and Lyme and Bartonella, for example, are bacterial infections, they both affect the body in the same way. They both provoke from our immune systems, a release of very similar inflammatory cytokines so we get the same symptoms. So there's a huge overlay of symptoms of Lyme and mold. So my first message is to look for Lyme, at, at least get some basic testing. And I have to add that many of the labs that do the test do not do an adequate job. If you're going to get the a test, you want to get it either from Igenix um, or from Infecto Labs, which, excuse me, in my opinion, are the two best labs in the country doing this test. Um, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I love when my son is just wanting to come up and join the conversation. Um, absolutely. So I appreciate you uh, going into mold, uh, excuse me, mold, into Lyme. Um, we have a good question that just popped up as well. Um, do you think that the source of Lyme in ASD is solely from ticks? Are no. there other sources of, yeah, are there other no. sources of Lyme? Um, and does Lyme mimic other diseases? I think I just said it did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, it's called the great masquerader. 
because it mimics so many other conditions because so many different organ systems are involved. But although ticks have a very bad rep in terms of being a major source of Lyme and the co-infections, you can get Lyme from um, um, flea bites, mosquito bites, black flies. Um, and that same thing is true for Bartonella, for example. About 40% of cats carry Bartonella. So if you've ever had a scratch or a bite from a cat, you can have Bartonella lying dormant until the immune system becomes weakened, and then it will emerge full bore. So you don't have to get Bartonella from um, a tick bite. You can get it from fleas, commonly, and cat exposure. Uh, so the bottom answer to that is it's not just about ticks. Um, I commonly hear people go, I live in a city. I only walk on sidewalks. It absolutely is not possible for me to have you know, a tick bite. And I go, well, okay, but why do you have Lyme? The answer is you can get it in other ways. Like I said, Dr. Nathan, just all the truth bombs today. I'm loving it. Um, can, there's also a question um, that had come up regarding food. Um, can you, um, like, what is the role, um, you know, how can you kind of, eat, how, how do I want to put this question? What diets do you recommend? Like, and, you know, again, everyone's different. Everyone has something that works better for them. But is there something that people can do to try to kind of, in a way, put their body in a good place to, I guess it'd be more for mold, hey, because if you have Lyme, but maybe food does feed Lyme as well. Is there anything you can recommend on like maybe on a food way basis um, for people that can also kind of target that in that way? Sure. The basic issue here is you don't want to feed candida or mold by eating a lot of carbs, especially sugar and fruit. So your basic diet is a high protein, low carb diet. And that's primary. We can go in a lot of details. Um, some people have are under the impression that there's a massive amount of mold toxin in food, and you have to be unbelievably careful about what you eat, or you're going to get mold toxicity from what you eat. That is extremely rare and highly unlikely. The amount of mold toxin in food, it does exist, but it's trivial. And the vast amount of toxin that we acquire comes from being in moldy buildings, what we inhale, which is why our sinuses are at high risk for colonization, because that's the first place of contact of these spores uh, when they enter our body. So you can read about low mold diets in terms of eliminating foods. Honestly, I generally think that's more restrictive than it needs to be. Rarely have I seen that be effective. Bottom line, high protein, low carb. Perfect. That's wonderful. Um, and another one is, uh, what are your favorite, I mean, you, would already, you actually already kind of said this, what your favorite binders were for mycotoxins. Are there specific binders for specific mycotoxins that you use? Again, just really individual specific. <clears throat> Yeah. Yep. Yes, there are. And again, in both of the books that I mentioned, I have tables that lay that out for people. So you can see, okay, I have okra toxin. The best binders for okra toxin are cholestyramine and activated charcoal. The best binder for gliotoxin is bentonite clay and saccharomyces boulardii and so on. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually very interested. I'm going to check with Enrique later to see how many dings. I know I'll be buying the books later just because it's, it's. I mean, it's just such an amazing tool to have. And again, it just it just helps with all the misconception regarding specific molds, specific binders, what to do. And if you're really like laying it out, it's very helpful for, for people that are, you know, are searching. Right. And, is and it is. And I was intended to be that way. But I have a caveat to that, which is, Please work with a healthcare provider who has worked with mold and knows what they're doing. Um, if you just jump in and start taking binders, there is a high risk that you're going to mobilize toxin faster than the body can process it and get worse. So um, this wasn't intended as a self-help book. Au contraire. You really need treating mold is tricky. It requires someone who can order a variety of supplements and medications for you to kill the mold. So it isn't something that you're going to be able to do on your own to cut corners. You're more likely to make yourself or your child worse if you if you start 
doing this without professional advice. Please don't do that. No, I think it's a, such an important point because, yeah, it, it can, especially because it's such a hard thing anyway. So, um, you know, if you're if you're not well versed with what you're looking at, like you said, you can definitely make things worse. So wonderful advice. Um, you had mentioned before the things that um, that can be symptoms of mold, um, like cognition issues, uh, rage, uh, headaches, etc. Uh, one of the questions is: Is that also um, is that the same uh, if you're colonized with mold as to versus just being maybe exposed with with mold mycotoxins, etc.? Um, what are those symptoms for colonized mold? They're, ident they're identical. Yeah. Understand that if mold has colonized, all it means is that it's now growing in your body. So some people are surprised that they're living in an obviously moldy environment and they leave that environment and they expect, okay, I'll be better because I'm not exposed to it anymore. Not if it's in you. So maybe a third of patients who leave their moldy environment feel much better if they go on a, um, a two-week vacation. They come back to the house and they feel worse again. That's fairly classical. But many people leave the moldy environment and move and don't feel better because of what's growing in them. So whether or not it's from some distant exposure or from colonization, the symptoms are identical. Okay. And then when just kind of bouncing back to, 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 uh, excuse me, to Lyme, um, cause we really haven't touched too much. I know you, you definitely give us like a kind of like a broad overview of it. Um, but I mean, how prevalent, like you're mentioning, um, you know, mold just seems to be like, you know, like the department of defense and you're talking about these things, you know, these are huge. It's 10 million Americans a year. You know, it's, it's a huge situation. Um, when it comes to Lyme, you know, it's really, it's interesting. Like you mentioned, it, there's, it's almost like you go to a regular doctor and they just brush you aside. You know, that there's no way you can have Lyme. We don't have Lyme here. Um, which of course, it's just like them saying you don't have parasites because we live in the United States and you're like, what are you talking about? So, you know, um, and so, but when it comes to ASD and it comes to Lyme, like how prevalent is Lyme in the ASD kids that you're seeing? Um, is it in maybe in a percentage style, just because it seems to be a hard thing for people to, um, like you said, IGNX is a very good lab um, to run, um, but it seems like it's a hard thing. People don't know they're hitting, you know, um, the candida, they're hitting the mold and they are, are maybe thinking we don't have Lyme, but how maybe how important is it to be doing it across the board? I don't know that I can answer that question because it's individual. It may depend partly on where you live. For example, it is so endemic in the Northeast that if you live in the Northeast, you really ought to look for it. But it's equally endemic in um, northern Wisconsin and Minnesota and in the whole Pacific Northwest, the area that I live, we see a lot of Lyme. There is no state in the country and no country in the world that hasn't seen Lyme. It's so I, I think we're asking the wrong question in terms of percentages because I can't give you that. I don't know. It's more in the category of if I have a child who has who's on the spectrum, I want to look for Lyme and mold in all of them because I don't want to miss it. And it would be and I've seen it be a mistake to blow it off and come back three years later and go, oh, my God, I should have checked for Lyme sooner because we could have been doing something about this. So that's the real issue. No, absolutely. And, you know, definitely want to kind of end on that, you know, hopeful, uh, like a hopeful um message to the audience. So one of the things that you had mentioned a few times, which is amazing, is that, you know, this is all treatable. So even though there's a lot of, you know, really great information out there, um, and they can definitely be found in your book, um, these things are treatable. And um, I guess that's like really like the the biggest takeaway is that testing is important. Being able to work with someone who um, is very knowledgeable in either mold, Lyme, hopefully both, um, et cetera. And then also to really get those protocols, um, those individual protocols out there for you specifically and really stick to it. So, um, so that's a wonderful thing. But do Dr. Nathan, is there anything else that you would like to tell us? Because I know your time is valuable. We've taken up at least an hour of it and we really appreciate it. But what, what else could you tell the community um, that can maybe be 
just a good like guiding light for them. <laughs> I, I think I think you gave me the opportunity to to say what I wanted to say uh, throughout, um, and I think we keep learning about more treatments that may be available soon. Um, as you noted, I, I work with um, Dr. Robert Navio. In fact, um, I'm honored to have published uh, one of the papers that he's written. We co-authored together. And um, he has done some amazing work, as many of you know, with autism by using the medication Suramin to reverse the inflammatory biochemical changes that we believe are the heart of all of these inflammatory disorders, and especially, you know, ASD. Um, I know that Dr. Navio is on the verge of, or has already embarked on, a second phase of the research that he, he published earlier, in which he's taking a larger group of children uh, with autism, um, treating half with Suramin and half without, so that the rest of the medical world can take his research more seriously. If you haven't looked at the videos, which is on his website, you can see the children who did get Suramin. Um, he has videos of their behavior before and afterward, and they are profound. So uh, the work that he's doing is fabulous, and it gives us hope that more additional help is on the way, hopefully sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Um, no, we would love to speak with Dr. Naveau. I know he's definitely in the thick of it, you know, doing his phase twos. And uh, we're very excited to see what becomes of that. Um, oh, you know, just one last question, because this is an interesting one. Um, it's, um, sorry, this is from Carla. And she had mentioned, um, so, some people had talked about like Malarone. I don't know if you've heard of Malarone. And yes, okay, so you, you are you're way ahead. Um, is Malarone sermon like No. No. No, not at all. Um, to my knowledge, I mean, uh, Suramin is very, very specific and that it binds very specific receptors in the body better than any other drug ever found yet. I know that the pharmaceutical industry is working on similar drugs or lookalikes, but malarone is entirely different. It's essentially for Babesia, for those patients who have wrestling with that as a part of their Lyme issue. Um, but no, malarone doesn't do that. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nathan. I think that we've learned a ton. We could probably just keep you here all day uh, and chatting and picking your brain. Um, but um, why don't you tell everyone, I do know that um, Enrique did put um, up some info, um, but uh, we're definitely going to link your um, your information. So if anyone would like to consult or get some information from Dr. Neil Nathan, it's www.neilnathanmd.com. And uh, we just really appreciate all the information and your time um, for speaking with us. Us. And um, we just really hope that we can, you know, just keep trucking along. Like you said, more help is on the way. And we thank you for being one of those, one of those wonderful doctors that's helping the community. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Okay. You too.